What's up, y'all? It's Tom. In the wide world of deep learning, two of the most important frameworks are PyTorch and TensorFlow. But it might make sense to go below the level of a neural network library and focus just on GPU acceleration with automatic gradient support. From this foundation, you can build your own deep learning and many other things. A Python library called JAX is one of the tools out there today that builds on this idea, simplifying the development of arbitrary machine learning algorithms. Other libraries and languages also exist in this space. And if you've watched the awkward evolution of the TensorFlow API over the years, you might know what motivates this. And I'll be back later to talk about languages and libraries beyond Python, but since this is a Fuego show, I'll pass the torch over to her meanwhile. Thanks for that, Tom. Tom is the co-host of this video, and he runs his own YouTube channel called Context Free, where he talks about programming languages. Tom is going to be helping us understand the language implications of these examples that we talk about today. If you've been on my channel before, or if you came over from the video on Tom's channel, you've probably heard of the PyTorch, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, and NumPy libraries. These are all popular Python libraries that allow for mathematical processing and different deep learning applications. PyTorch and TensorFlow were designed specifically for machine learning, and while they provide every basic mathematical operation, they are still really designed for neural network processing and can be kind of heavy when doing simple algorithms. These libraries are super popular because they provide simple access to the GPU for accelerated computing. However, implementing something very simple in PyTorch and TensorFlow might take a long time to debug, and so it might be easier to use a simpler library like NumPy or Scikit-Learn. However, these libraries don't provide any built-in GPU functionality. So when choosing between Python frameworks to do machine learning algorithms, we're often left with choosing between a very difficult to use API that speeds up computing significantly significantly, or an easy-to-use API that is kind of slow. Jack simplifies many machine learning operations into a NumPy-like API with functionality that can be easily swapped out for existing NumPy operations. Additionally, Jax provides just-in-time compilation that also exposes the GPU-accelerated computing functionalities to the user. So today, we're going to look at the similarities and differences between using a library like Jax versus using something like Scikit-Learn, PyTorch, or TensorFlow to do simple to complex machine learning algorithms. So the common thing between all of these Python-based libraries is that when they typically expose accelerated to computing, they do it in a way that utilizes the GPU. Other languages use other features to improve parallelization. I'm going to let Tom explain a bit how functional programming languages specifically can improve parallelization. Functional programming contrasts with imperative programming, which many of us may have learned first. In imperative programming, you change values of your variables, you update contents in your array, while you're calculating your result. In functional programming, however, functions are more like in math. They have input arguments and output values, but they don't change anything. An easy go-to example for this is MapReduce. In MapReduce, you have a whole bunch of input data values, map them through some operation in parallel, and then reduce or combine them at the end. For example, in deep learning, you might map a bunch of images through processing and then combine them into a single prediction loss. If these map operations depend on each other, if there's side effects, if values are changing, then it's hard to run them in parallel. And ideally, your reduce operation can be run in arbitrary order as well. It doesn't matter in which order you add numbers together. So functional programming makes your code easier to analyze and easier to parallelize, which is why we see in JAX that if your functions have side effects, in other words, if they aren't actually functions, then you might have unexpected behavior as a result. And while functional programming languages have been around for decades, we find that in recent years, some mainstream languages are picking up features from them, such as Java and C Sharp. And you might find that if you code in a functional style, you'll also understand your own program better sometimes, as well as making it easier to use in frameworks such as JAX. In the companion video to this one that's on my channel, I chose to emphasize NX for the programming language Elixir, as well as the programming language DEX. Elixir, unlike Python, is a functional language and is also very good for concurrent processing, great for writing network services, for example, in a robust and maintainable fashion, in part due to the functional programming aspect of the language itself. You don't modify data values in Elixir. But like Python, Elixir traditionally hasn't been very fast at computing, and NX is an attempt at changing this. It can use the same XLA library that JAX uses to compile code to CPU or GPU for high-speed execution, as well as having automatic differentiation support. And interestingly, even though Elixir is a functional language, it still has a restricted language inside of it to support this compilation. And on top of NX, they started building a neural network library called Axon. Moving on to the DEX programming language, I chose to highlight it because it's being developed by some of the same people who contribute to JAX. But this language is being built from the ground up as a functional language for parallel processing, such as on the GPU. And it has explicit control over the kinds of side effects that happen in your program. Other languages you might look at for auto diff and GPU acceleration support these days include Julia, F Sharp, Swift, Kotlin, or others. And they have different pros and cons to them. 
For example, you might use F-sharp for integration with a .NET framework. But whatever you choose, this field is continuing to explode, and a lot of options are available. So let's go back to Python. First, we're going to be comparing JAX and scikit-learn to do simple linear regression. All the code for this video is going to be in the description box below. First, we're going to run a little Docker container that actually installs all the environment variables for us. If you've seen my video on Docker containers, you'll know why I'm doing this because I don't want to pollute my computer. So we're going to use an IPython command line to run most of these examples. So if you look at the regression example, I've written some code to do the exact same thing in scikit-learn and in JAX. First, we can make a data set, and this uses basic scikit-learn functionalities to make a train and test regression-based data set. Additionally, I defined losses using NumPy, as well as JAX, and I also defined the training methods for regression, as well as the evaluation methods for that regression model for both sklearn and JAX. So one thing to note was while the evaluations are very similar, the actual training is different. The sklearn regression model forces you to use their algorithm to actually optimize things. However, for JAX, we're actually doing the optimization ourselves using a gradient descent-like approach, where we're actually calculating that gradient using the JAX autograd functionality. We're additionally wrapping this in the JAX JIT decorator, which exposes that just-in-time compilation that accelerates the GPU operations. So let's actually just make the data set and evaluate the regression on the two models. So for this linear regression model, the first example in which we had 100,000 samples, we see that the loss for sklearn and the loss for JAX are very close to zero. So that means that they've both learned a very good regression model over the data set. However, when we look at the timing for 100,000 examples, we'll see that sklearn actually beats JAX by about 1.2 milliseconds. This is because 100,000 samples isn't a significant amount of data. So when we looked at the example with 10 million samples, we'll see that JAX actually outperforms sklearn by a factor of five to six, with sklearn taking about 750 milliseconds to train and JAX taking about 150 milliseconds to train. So this is a significant speed up when we have a large amount of data. Now let's get into the second example. We're going to classify digits of the MNIST digit recognition data set. There are tens of thousands of images in this data set, and furthermore, every image has hundreds of pixels. So this can be considered a large data set, and we'll really see how JAX can speed up computation by simplifying the API. So I did a very similar thing here where I created a data set generation function as well as some initialization and training functions for both PyTorch and JAX. And so we're going to do each of the examples separately and compare the two. And so we see here how the accuracy between the PyTorch model and the JAX model, they're really no different. They both get about 94% accuracy, and they're also trained for the same batch size, the same learning rate parameters, and the same number of epics. However, the timing is actually pretty interesting. The PyTorch model takes about 12 seconds to train, so running over the entire train data set and doing that optimization at each step. But the JAX model actually takes three seconds per loop on that entire MNIST data set. The MNIST data set has tens of thousands of examples. So this is interesting that JAX actually has a four times speed improvement as compared to PyTorch. Now I will mention that there could be optimizations that we can do in terms of the way that the language is written. So keep that all in mind. What I really wanted to show here is that it's really simple to do facts JAX computing and actually convert any algorithm that's written in PyTorch, sklearn, or even TensorFlow into a JAX machine learning model because it provides a lot of similar functionality. If you're interested in the more deep learning focused parts of JAX, check out the JAX experimental stack set module. Stacks is awesome because you can build a lot of very complex neural network models that you would also be able to build in PyTorch or TensorFlow. That's it for this video. If you enjoyed this video, definitely give it a like. And also, if you're not subscribed, subscribe to my channel and I'll see y'all in the next one. Later!